this is you. Imagine for a moment you were to find yourself in the deep sea. Pesky problems like breathing underwater aside, you might want a couple of nifty adaptations to survive and thrive in what is literally the largest environment on Earth. Let's talk to an expert, benthic biologist Dr David Hughes. I've been working as a deep sea biologist since 1998 when I joined uh, the group of Professor John Gage, who was the uh, head of deep sea benthic biology at the time. And I'm now currently a lecturer um, and I lecture on a variety of subjects, including deep sea biology. Deep sea exploration and biology generally considered to have begun with the Challenger expedition, which um, ran from 1872 to 76. It was the first big um, government-funded oceanographic expedition, and that's generally considered to mark the foundation of deep sea science. Some of the most key, uh, most important characteristics of it are firstly that it's very, it's almost completely dark. Um, this, this one here is, is, is called a rabbit fish, or sometimes, they're sometimes called chimeras. They all got, they've all got big eyes, so they're obviously all capable of seeing something, either they're living at depths where there is still just a tiny amount of sunlight left, or they're looking for bioluminescence, for um, living, living lights in their environment. So the darkness will definitely be an issue. But it's not only animals that struggle with the dark. Without light, photosynthetic plants, which form the basis for most food webs, can't exist. Therefore, food in the deep sea is scarce. We will need some more adaptations. Uh, because there are no green plants there, it's um, almost de completely dependent on organic matter produced near the surface, sinking down to the, to the d deeper uh, layers. So th th this one here is a gulper eel. Um, as you see, it is a long eel-like fish. So this is this is the head here, um, with a very long, thin body and tail, and it's almost entirely mouth. It is basically just a mouth on on the end of a very long, thin body and tail. And because it's living in an environment where there's very little food. There's a very, very low density of animals in, in its surroundings. It has to be able to take advantage of any meal that may come its way. In the deep sea, predators can't afford to let a mouthful go by. But some animals have evolved formidable defences. The deep sea um, spiny king crab. But this, this com comes from the rock all trough. Um, and it, it's obviously very spiny, as you can see. It's got these very long, uh, sharp spines dotted all over its uh, carapace and, and legs. And it means you have to be a bit careful picking them up. And I guess these are almost certainly um, defensive adaptations against predators, and predators being probably fish. But I guess that would be quite a, a spiny mouthful if you tried to, uh, try to eat it. I think that they're generally um, scavengers and, and predators of small animals on the seabed. So you've learned to deal with the pressures of predation. But now it's time to deal with a different sort of pressure. So if you go down to the very deepest point of the ocean, say 10,000 metres deep in a, in a Pacific trench, water pressure there is approximately 1,000 atmospheres, so 1,000 times the pressure that we're experiencing on our bodies right now. In this jar we've got three, three individuals, I think, of the, uh, the long-tailed sea cucumber. Um, these came from uh, roughly three and a half thousand metres depth at the southern end of the rock all trough. Um, they are echinoderms, which means that they're distant relatives of the starfish and sea urchins and brittle stars. But the, the, this particular species is, is um, from a habitat we call the abyssal plain, which is the um, three and a half to four thousand meters down, and these animals are basically um, mobile vacuum cleaners. They they feed by um, just walking very very slowly over the over the, the, the seabed, hoovering up the, the the top layer of sediment and digesting any organic material that they they find in that. 
Sometimes you've just got to be like a sea cucumber, unbothered by the pressure you're under. Well, so far you're surviving in the deep sea. Adapted to the lack of sunlight, you've stopped bumping into things. You're well set for the predator-prey evolutionary arms race, and the water pressure has stopped bothering you. You might, however, be feeling a bit lonely. This is a, a, a deep sea anglerfish. This fish is a female, all, all the fish that look like this are females. And the male is actually a tiny thing that would only be about a centimetre or so long, that lives permanently attached to the female's body and just does nothing but fertilise her eggs. Um, he doesn't do any feeding himself, he just is supplied food from her blood system. And this is a very, a very unusual reproductive system, but all of the deep sea anglerfish seem to, seem to show it. But again, it's, it's, a, it's an adaptation to living in an environment where populations are very low and very widely scattered. Given what you've heard about the deep sea, that it's, it's very dark, it's very cold, very high water pressure, there's not much food. Uh, if you were going to live there, what kind of adaptations would you choose to uh, make life a bit easier?